to close. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for this webinar training on speech contest and how to carry that out as an official, a contest chair and or a vice president of education who may fulfill that role at the club level. I'm Gary Behrens. I am the chief contest judge for District 103. We've conducted several of these programs through Zoom meetings previously last year and now again this year. This is the second one for this year. We will be having some additional ones following this for the chief judge and for contest voting judges or um, tie-breaking judges to attend as well through the remainder of this month and into next month in November. But this is an opportunity for Toastmasters who are interested in holding a club contest or getting a jump on advanced level contests that they may participate in at the area or division level later on in 2022 to become familiarized with the role and responsibility and duties of a contest chair. Because the contest chair, as we'll see, is the person who really makes things happen. And I am going to take the mo this moment now, and I probably should have done it right away, to share my screen with the presentation itself. So let me share this. Open it up and get us started. Minimize this. Now, I've given you a little bit of a preview about what this particular presentation is about. A guide for contest chairs on how to conduct a speech contest. First question that often comes up, particularly for club level contests, is, well, why do we need to have a contest? Why would we have a speech contest? We haven't done it before. Maybe we have, but there's not a lot of momentum and excitement and energy right now for a contest. Should we have one? And do we have to? Well, a speech contest is an option for clubs to hold as a special event, as an extra activity around their regular program. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but really it comes down to the fact that there are a lot of dividends and benefits for having a speech contest. Of course, first of all, it's an opportunity for members to participate as contestants and gain additional experience in delivering public speaking, in practicing, and doing that in a very different context from a regular meeting or pursuing their education program projects through the Pathways Education Program. This takes it to another level. They're now in a competitive environment, a competitive setting with more pressure, which is not unlike sometimes real life, where an individual may be in a situation where they're asked to give some sort of a talk or communicate in a high pressure situation. Not necessarily contest, but there may be pressure around that. It's also an opportunity for the organizers of the club to put this program together, put this con a contest together and develop their leadership skills in doing so. And for other participants, all the participants really nearly, there is the opportunity to apply that experience to gaining credit and recognition for their Pathways projects 
in the various paths and at the various levels, perhaps as electives, that they can give a speech about their experience, what they did, what they learned, and how they would apply that to that particular path and project. For the audience, both the members and guests who may attend, they learn about Toastmasters and public speaking. And that might translate for the club into benefits of gaining new members, keeping their current members interested and involved through that activity of having a contest. So let's go on and talk about the foundations of a speech contest, but let me first invite my co-host, Camaria, to share an initial poll, audience poll with us. This is one question to ask of our attendees, what is your confidence level about conducting an online speech contest at this point in time? have one or two respondents here. Okay. Let's see if we have any others. No. Yep, two of two, I see. Okay. Then let's call it a draw here. <laughs> Somewhat mm -hmm. confident to completely confident. That's good to see that we have uh, some uh, experience and some openness to gaining more experience and wanting to learn. So that's great. And that's what we're going to accomplish this evening with our participants. You'll have a chance to learn more about what it takes and what's involved in uh, conducting a speech contest and perhaps gain some new insights as well uh, and share any experiences that you've had to date. So let's move on. If you would like to take our poll down for us, maybe I can do that and talk about the foundations for a speech contest. Go to the next slide. Exactly what is a speech contest? How is it different from anything else that our club does? I've already alluded to the fact that it's different in the sense that this is outside the ordinary flow of club activities and regular club meetings. It is an organized club endeavor. In that way, it is similar uh, to other events, let's call it, that the club may do, such as an open house. Perhaps that might be one activity that would be comparable in a sense. In this case, it builds interest and excitement among the members because it promotes some friendly competition to see who are the best speakers in our club. It's accompanied by judging, which is different from evaluations. So it's not a public feedback um, in terms of uh, the evaluators presenting their reactions and suggestions to a speaker, that judging and the results remain secret. It leads to recognition and awards. Some clubs have awards for various and recognition for various accomplishments that members may uh, achieve. And there's that opportunity with contests as well. And the winner of a contest in a given contest event can advance to the next level of competition within the governance structure of our district. And that would be to the area level and potentially beyond if they should win at the area level. And of course, there everyone can take pride in pulling it together and making it happen. Now, how does it actually work? Well, there are two contests every year that the district sanctions authorizes as the contests that will be held within 
District 103. One of those is the International Speech Contest, which is mandated by Toastmasters International to be held at uh, the district level annually. So that's a given. Every district is expected to hold an international speech contest to declare a winner, to determine who the winner is that will advance to regional quarterfinals and potentially to the world championships. That necessitates that you need to have some participants, some contestants uh, to conduct that district contest and that flows down through the different levels to division, to area, and ultimately to the clubs. This is a grassroots event that everybody is encouraged to participate in so that we can determine who are the better speakers and ultimately crown the winner of the champion at district level. The other contest is discretionary. It's optional for each district to determine what the second contest can be. And they can have as many other contests as they like during the year, but they need to determine one that will be uh, defined as the uh, required speech or the authorized speech contest. And this year, that will be the table topics speech contest. Our district in the few years that we've been around now, about five, has alternated between the other types of contests. Typically those include evaluation speech contests as we did last year, and also a humorous speech contest. There are other types as well. This year, it will be the table topics contest. In order to run a contest, you need to be able to brief the participants who are key to the outcomes. That includes the contestants and the judges. There are also instructions that are given to the audience members on how they should participate and what their responsibilities are. Contestant speaking order is determined randomly. Judges mark special ballots for each type of contest once each contestant has concluded their speech delivery. Those ballots and also timesheets are collected. And that's another feature that's different from the usual event of a club meeting. Yes, you have a timer who keeps the time for each type of uh, presentation that participants, club members may give, whether it's a speech, an evaluation, table topics, and so forth. And those are reported back publicly to the entire group. While timesheets are also kept secret, as are those ballots for a contest, and those are forwarded to the chief judge and to the ballot counters to determine who the winners are. Meanwhile, contestants are interviewed so that the audience gets to know them better. And all of this, of course, takes planning, organizing, and procedural control and management. The two key figures in making that happen are the contest chair, which is the role we're focusing on this evening, who acts as the project manager to put it all together. The other is the chief judge, who manages the contest event itself. So you could see that each of those roles has somewhat different, but overlapping and related responsibilities and duties. The contest chair appoints the chief judge and also a contest master. If they choose not to serve in that role themselves. Uh, and I, by way of that, what I'm saying is, I mentioned, I think uh, a few minutes ago that the vice president of education, as you may know, is responsible for uh, ranging for a speech contest for the club each year. This is one of the vice president of education's responsibility. They can designate a contest chair to carry that out for them, or they can perform that role themselves. 
Likewise, the contest chair, whether it's the VPE or someone appointed, would have the responsibility for conducting the contest as the contest master or the contest toastmaster, if you like, or they can designate someone else to do that. If it's an online contest, which is going to be the case again this year as last year, it's important to have a Zoom master as well who can help manage the technology aspect and make sure that the uh, event is broadcast, the meeting is set up, that individuals are able to join appropriately and so forth. In addition to those key resource persons, the contest chair also has the opportunity to appoint a committee of other individuals who will assist them in carrying out specific tasks. Importantly, for the table topics speech contest, the Zoom, the contest chair is the person who determines what that will be at each contest level, whether it's in the club, the area, the division, and ultimately the district level contest. So they pick, that person picks the question, they keep it secret, Unlike in club meetings where it may be announced, or at least the general theme may be announced, they keep that secret. And the only other person that they might inform about that, and what the question is, is if there is a contest master that they've appointed separately. That person will need to know in order to announce that to the contestants. If there is an evaluation speech contest, being held as there was last year. The contest chair also has the responsibility to recruit the test speaker and keep that a secret until that individual is introduced as the test speaker. They, in addition, have the responsibility to invite any external guests and dignitaries, which might be their area director, their division director, or others uh, with some level of leadership responsibility in the district. I'm not going to go through the litany of the responsibilities of the chief judge. You can read those here, and those we'll be talking about in more detail in a follow-up webinar that it is scheduled for October 28th, and again, November 10th. So let's move on here and talk about what those contest chair duties are. Just saw a high level description of them, but we need to drill down further and talk about all the features and facets of those responsibilities. I mentioned that the contest chair would need to appoint a uh, committee, sorry, and that committee has a number of activities and tasks in front of them. Among those, and the contest chair leads these discussions and then delegates responsibilities accordingly to who will be in charge for making that happen. First of all, what is our budget going to be? Well, the budget can be very small for a club contest, as uh, it typically can be run as you already do your contest, your regular club meetings. But there can be some additional costs, costs of refreshments, cost of awards, if you're going to give something special to the uh, top uh, contenders, first, second, and third place. But usually you can just uh, provide certificates. There are templates for that on Toastmasters International for the first, second, and third place uh, winners, as well as for participation. Determining where, when, and how uh, the contest will be held is another responsibility. If it's at your usual meeting place for an in-person meeting, that works well. 
Uh, it's a matter of determining though within the schedule and calendar of your uh, club when to fit in a contest and have enough lead time to actually plan for it and get all the organizing done. One of the resources that I shared with our uh, registered participants last night was a template for the calendar planning out of a contest. It's recommended that you start planning about a month to a month and a half in advance, even two mm -hmm. months for contest in order to have enough time to uh, take care of all the activities that need to go out. We just had our, shortly before this webinar, we had our club officer meeting and we're talking about having our club contest in the first week of December. So that gives us about mm, maybe two, not quite two months, six to seven weeks. And that's important because you need to start corralling everybody, finding out who are going to be your participants, your contestants, your functionaries, and start recruiting them. You also want to have time to publicize and promote the contest, both within your club, but on social media as well to draw outside guests who would be interested in attending. And that's much easier to have happen when it's on Zoom, when it's a, a virtual online meeting. So you want to try to reach your audience with enough time that they have it planned into their calendar as well. You'll want to create a program for it. I mentioned getting the certificates or the awards. And of course, for your contestants and your participants, your functionaries, make sure they have the rules at hand and are familiarized with those. That your judges have their ballots. That both judges and participants, the contestants, have the eligibility forms available to them. And finally, if you are having an in-person meeting at your club meeting site, you may want to have refreshments. Now I've mentioned briefing. And by the way, let me just ask, is everybody able to see the um, top of, the, of each screen where it has the uh, heading? Can you see that clearly? Yes. Okay, good. I mentioned before on an earlier slide that the contestants need to be briefed and the judges need to be briefed. The chief judge briefs the judges. The contest chair briefs the contestants. It's a good idea if you have designated someone else to be the contest Toastmaster in your place that you invite them to the briefing as well so that they are familiarized with the, who the contestants are for each of the speeches, each of the contest, that they or you have verified how that individual would like there to be introduced as far as their name and the pronunciation of it. I'm sure all of you have seen times where a contestant was introduced in a manner that did not actually convey their full name accurately or clearly. And that's important for the benefit of both their own self pride, but also the audience members. They may be able to check it against the program that you put together as well as the judges so that they know who they are uh, watching and judging. But let's, let's you know, make sure that we honor our contestants and be able to say their name clearly and appropriately. Make sure that you have the eligibility forms as the contest chair on hand, that they're signed, that they're completed correctly. Last year, we had some confusion in a couple of instances over whether or not a contestant was eligible. 
based on their eligibility form. Get the profile form. That's another resource that will be useful to have them complete ahead of time to facilitate the interview by the contest master. Go over what the timing method will be and what signals will be used. That's useful and critical really uh, for the contestants to know and be able to see or determine where the signals will be coming from. The contest judge, chief judge will also handle that as well at the, uh, and the contest master at the introduction of a speaker, but they need to be able to see clearly where the timer is, what the timing signals are, what the time limits are, and they're pretty much consistent with the usual time limits that we use in our club meetings, five to seven minutes for an international speech contest, one to two minutes, for a table topics contest. And these are in the rule book that I shared with our registered participants. So make sure that those are clearly communicated. It's important to remind those contestants to pin the timer if, they, if necessary before they begin their speech. Also important to draw for speaking order and determine how that will be done. Ideally, it will be in a random method. It's different than when we have held contests in person where we had slips of paper with numbers on them. Now that's not as easily done using the old fashioned method. So it's important to find a different method of doing that. And I saw some creative uh, solutions to that last year at various contests. Once we get the show on the road, the doors are open, the contestants are ready, the judges are ready, the contest master is ready to begin on time, you're presiding over the contest. The contest chair ultimately has that authority. The contest master may be doing the honors if so designated. Welcome the audience. Recite the usual protocols that the briefings have been done of the contestants and of the judges. Contest rules have been reviewed, reminding the audience not to take pictures. And of course, if you are going to be recording the contest, and you may or may not choose to do that optionally at the club level, then you need to read the official PI, TI Toastmasters International Policy for video recording. You'll introduce the contest master, give an appropriate build up to welcome the contest master. You have designated someone as the VPE or the contest chair to do that. Separately, the contest chair still retains responsibility for addressing any protest as to contestant eligibility. There are multiple ways that a protest, protest can be lodged. Several of them have to do with the speech uh, delivery itself, but the one that the contest master, contest chair is responsible for is clearing up any protest regarding to eligibility that may be lodged by someone other than the contestant. So that's where that eligibility form is critical to make sure that that's been completed, signed, is uh, accurate, and that other criteria for eligibility have been met. Any other types of protests go to the chief judge. The chief judge works with the judges on that. If the chief judge determines there are other types of disqualifications, including time disqualifications, they would inform the contest chair. The contest chair would either announce that or relay that to the contest master, but usually the contest chair should announce that. 
And the contest chair also has the honor and privilege of presenting the awards to the winners and closing the meeting of the contest officially. I mentioned interviews. That would normally be handled by the contest master who would be working with the contest chair as well as the chief judge and Zoom master around the timing of that and when that should occur. It should happen while the contest uh, chief judge and the ballot counters are out of the room and possibly the judges too, to bring each of the, bring all of the contestants back up in my, and then conduct a brief interview with them. In, at the club level and at the area level, that might be done separately for the first contest. And usually the first contest is the, um, the discretionary contest that's being held such as the table topics contest. So interview all those contestants and then interview the international speech contest after that event has, and contest has been concluded. At the club level, you may have overlap where members are participating in both contests and it may make more sense to just interview everybody at the end of, the, of both of those events. Recog at the beginning, the contest master can recognize any guests, outside guests and special dignitaries by name. They should introduce each contestant in turn according to the random order that was drawn or determined by announcing first their name, their speech title, repeat the speech title, and their name again. That would be for the international speech contest. Clearly with the table topics contest, it will be a bit different. If you've seen that in a, a speech contest, typically the individual contestant is brought into the room when it's their turn. They've been sequestered with the sergeant at arms. So uh, until it was their turn, so they would not hear what the question is or the other contestant the contestant ahead of them, what their response was. So they're brought into the room. They're announced as the next contestant by stating their name and then repeating their name. They then come forward or they turn on the camera and the contest master would announce to them the table topics question. After each contestant has spoken, the contest master can ask for one minute of silence in order for the judges to concentrate on marking their ballots undisturbed. For the table topics or the evaluation contest, the contest master after that one minute of silence will cue the Sergeant at arms to bring the next contestant in to the room. And by the way, I guess I didn't mention that the sergeant at arms with all of the contestants in that particular speech contest would be sequestered in a separate breakout room. But we'll talk about that again uh, momentarily when we look at the differences between in-person and online contests. I've already talked about interviewing the contestants. The contest master can present participation certificates, certificates of participation to each of the contestants as they are interviewed. Okay, I shared with our registered uh, participants, our attendees last night, some frequently asked questions regarding the contest chair's role, as well as more general ones that uh, are on the Toastmasters International website. You have a list of resources and links to those uh, on the Toastmasters International website that I would recommend that you check out. You'll see more information there. And there are also some additional frequently asked questions that we encountered last year as we were doing these training sessions 
that have been compiled and organized, and you'll get those after, after our uh, session this evening. So what are a few of the more frequent and typical ones? Well, at the club level, how many people do we really need to have a contest? Well, that depends in part on how many folks you have in your club, as well as how many roles you're, and functionary roles you're going to assign. The maximum is probably about 15. The minimum that you could perhaps get by with is 12, maybe one or two less. You can see here what, what those are and how many you need. And you could see where there are some flexibilities in the rules. Again, you can check the International Speech Contest official rule book to see where your where the line is drawn. It helps to have those first four or five roles filled, obviously, in order to run the show. With judges, it's recommended to have five, unless it's impractical. Tie-breaking judge, you should have one of those, one person to be the tie-breaking judge in case there are ties. Timers, not just one as in the typical club meeting, but two, so you have a backup, and ballot counters. You have two, again, a less impractical, so that in case someone does an error, has a, a, a miscalculation in adding points from the ballots, you have someone to cross check with. How much time should we plan for a contest? If you've had a contest at your club before, you probably have planned it so that it fits into your usual club meeting time. That might be an hour, it might be an hour and a half. Again, it depends on how you're going to plan this out. The contest chair has will work with the contest committee as well as the chief judge to figure out how much time they're going to take and allot that. The more contestants you have, potentially the longer it may take. And you might have time to squeeze in a short break between the contests. For an online contest, what we were finding last year is that it can take a bit longer, maybe 30% to 50% longer. And that has to do with some confusion and technology hiccups that we run into with judges being able to submit their ballots appropriately with the ballot counters getting those ballots and then meeting in the separate room, the breakout room with the chief judge to figure out what the point totals are. Even when there is an in-person meeting, it can take a while. I was a chief judge for a, a division contest two or three years ago. And by the time we completed all the tallying and worked out the results, you know, the contest chair <laughs> and the division, the division director were wondering, where it's taking them so long to get back with those results. So there are some challenges in bringing it all together that you need to plan for. We did work out a solution for the advanced level contest towards the end of the contest season last year for the division contest and ultimately for the district contest to help speed it up. And that involved taking the judges out of the room for these online contests and putting them in a separate breakout room with supervision by the sergeant at arms to be a go-between with the uh, ballot counters and the chief judge to make sure they had submitted their 
ballots. They knew how to do it. They knew what to do and to confirm that they had submitted it. And that way we didn't have to hold up the whole event with everybody remaining silent in the main venue until everything got straightened out. So those are some efficiencies that we were able to identify. It may or may not work or be useful at your club level contest. It'll certainly be helpful for area contests and on up to keep in mind. Okay, that allows some activities to go on such as the interviews of the contestants, any special announcements that need to be made uh, by your dignitaries and so forth while the judges are completing and submitting their ballots and we're getting that taken care of for the ballot counting. So keep those in mind, but I guarantee you it will take a little bit longer than you anticipate uh, for your contest to be completed in an online venue. Well, is there a checklist that can help us figure all this out and get everything planned out and actually conduct the contest? Yes. In the speech contest rule book, there are checklists, general checklists for the contest chair, for the chief judge, as well as for the contestants on what they knew, need to do to be prepared such as completing their eligibility forms. So that's available to you in the rule book that I shared with you. There is also a template that I provided last night to our registered uh, attendees. I mentioned it earlier, basically a layout, a template of uh, calendar planning and the tasks to do six weeks out, five weeks out, four weeks out, three weeks out, it's your countdown. Get these things done each week until you're right up to the uh, day of the contest. And you can even plan out your contest very uh, along similar lines. What's going to happen when? Just like you have an agenda for your club meeting using the free toast host standard template agenda, you can do the same thing. You can create one for your contest in that application as well. There are other contest management resources that we've called and found online from other districts. Those will be included in some resources I'll share with you after this webinar, probably over the weekend. It may not be uh, tonight or to uh, the next couple of nights as I have other meetings and events, but I'll get that to you by the weekend. And there are more that you might find as well online. A question that usually comes up is, can members split duties between being a contestant and being a functionary for the contest? Short answer, no. Check the rule book. Rule 2C7B says that contest chairs, all these ones that are listed here, may not compete at the same contest in which they are serving as a functionary. So some people like to split hairs and say, well, there's two different contests, the international and the table topics. Could I be a functionary for one of those and a contest for, contestant for the other one? Doesn't really work so well. It's one or the other. You're either competing or you are a, a functionary or an official. And by extension, this should apply to the contest master who's actually conducting that event and the Zoom master, right? For online contests. Somebody's gotta be at the control panel. So let's not split hairs, just put it out there. You can be one or the, or the other not both at the same time. Uh, but what about, um, can we be a, uh, compete in some way and, and do functionary roles? And there is, I wouldn't quite call it a uh, loophole on this, or actually, I'm sorry, this one is multi, I did that one already. This is about being a multiple funk roles. 
Remember back a couple of questions ago where there was the listing of how many timers to have, how many ballot counters to have, et cetera. And they were also conditioned on, is it practical? Can we do this? And do we need, can someone double up? Can they be a judge and a timer? Not really. Can they be a timer and a ballot counter? Maybe, maybe because the timing ends after the contest, the ballot counting begins, possibly. There's not a specific rule, but there is a, that prevents it, but the rules do say that they shouldn't serve in more than run, one role at the same contest beyond the club level. And really when it comes down to it, we need their undivided attention on whatever task it is that they are supposed to be doing so they're not distracted. That's my recommendation as chief contest judge. Well, I've been doing a lot of talking here up to this point. You're probably in shell shock. <laughs> First time you've considered doing a contest at your club. Let's stop here and take a few minutes to answer some questions that might have popped into your head that I didn't address as part of the frequently answered questions. And I'll ask my co-host, Tom Maria, are there any questions that have gone out in the chat or any questions you put out that have been responded to? So we do have a few questions and I know some of them may have been answered. We have such a small group. So, you know, it's fine for people to ask directly if they still have the questions. So I'll start with Rosie who had a few questions. Okay. Um, yeah, Rosie, feel free to share any of the questions that you still have. Sure. So I understand the contest has to be done by the end of December. So I got that question answered. Thank when you. we're doing the contest virtually, how are the ballots handled? Uh, thousand dollar question. We won't get up to the uh, sixty thousand or hundred thousand dollar question yet. Uh, those can be handled in a couple of different ways. There is some guidance from Toastmasters International on uh, there's a resource at the Toastmasters International website or contest, speech contest. And if you haven't located that or visited it yet, there is a link on one of the handouts that I shared last night. You just go to Toastmasters International and then in uh, Leadership Central, you'll see that in that drop down that one of the links is to contest, speech contest. You go there and you'll find a lot of these resources. One of those is a guide to best practices for online speech contests. That's a great resource to have. I think I have it included in the materials uh, that I'll be sharing with you afterwards as well. So the, the bottom line question is, well, how do we get those um, ballots back? Ideally, they can send everybody, all your judges that is, can send those to one person. It might be one of the ballot counters, it might be this uh, chief judge who then distributes to the ballot counters. And they do that by email, or they might do that um, by snapping a picture with their smartphone and then texting that over attach, as an attachment. Those would probably be the preferred ways to make sure we get the results or their ballot to someone in charge of doing the counting. So there's a list that's in that best practices um, resource that I would recommend checking it. Sounds good. Uh, Gary, the only other question I had is how many, like what is the minimum number of contestants that we should have? One. Oh, okay. One, 
and you'll see in the in the rules that it says it it does make provision for occasions when maybe there is only one contestant. When that's the case, all the rules still apply. You have, if you're holding a contest, even if there's only one participant in a given contest, all the criteria must be met for eligibility and for qualification of that speech. In other words, they can be disqualified if they go over the time huh. limits. The time limits they have are, um, I'm gonna think about this a moment. With the International Speech Contest, you have four and a half minutes up to seven and a half minutes to be in the qualified zone, right? It's a five to seven minute speech. That's what we aim for in our club meetings. You get a grace period, 30 seconds either way that can still be considered qualified. That's where your timing is critical. For the table topics contest, on the other hand, there's only a grace period on the upside. So there has to be at least a minimum of one minute, can't be 30 seconds, one minute up to two and a half minutes. If you have, and so they have to meet that criteria and in order to be. Uh, so Gary, if, if it's just the one, then there's no judging that's for true. the contest except just the time. If that's it's true. just one person, okay. That's true. Yeah, so I saw that and maybe some of you had the experience even uh, at an area contest. Uh, where I, before we went uh, virtual last year at the very beginning in January, February, a couple of times, there was only one contestant that came, you know, that was there. And so the judges didn't need to fill out their ballot forms. The, the person still needed to be within time. Now, another aspect of this, Rosie, since you bring the question up, if you know ahead of time that there's only one contestant, there's also provision, special provision in the rule book that a club may choose not to have a contest for a variety of reasons. If there is only one contestant for each of these two types of contests, you know, instead of going to the effort of organizing a full scale sure. contest, you can nominate that person, designate them by whatever means the club determines to represent the club at the area contest. And so Gary, the last question that I have is, uh, so all of the contests this fall are gonna be table topics contests, correct? In addition to the international speech contest. Right, so if one of the clubs like if my club wanted to do a speech contest, it would have to be a table topics with the theme. With the question, yes. The right. One question, everybody, if I wasn't clear, everybody gets the same question. Gotcha, okay. So it's different and from the club table topics, <coughs> club meeting table topics where you may, you have different questions for everybody. Everybody okay. answers the same question and that's why they have to all be out of the room until it's their turn. So right. does, the, does the contest chair or the contest master have a question? I mean, create the a question. Uh, one of the first slides that I, I presented, I uh, specified, and this comes from the rule book, the contest chair determines what the question will be. Okay, thank you. If the contest chair that. is not serving as the contest master, they need to let the contest master know what that question what is. Question usually okay. that would be just prior to the contest beginning. Okay. Is that helpful? That Absolutely. The question? Okay. Absolutely. I was late, so I didn't get to first last. That's all right. Okay. I appreciate it. I realized that. And some others might have been too. So I'm glad you brought the question up. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Any I'm, other, I'm, let's do one more question, then we'll move forward here. It's seven o'clock, and I have a few other details to share with you. One more question from anyone. Um, Gary, can you confirm what was the handout from the webinar that you mentioned last night? 
Yes, there actually was not a webinar last night. What I shared with the folks who were pre-registered for tonight's webinar, I, pro I provided them with some advanced materials, preview materials. Ah, that okay, yes, and I saw that email, okay. Comrie, I shared that with you too. Yep. So that's there right. were several things I made reference to them. Not everything. I didn't overload you. They, everybody will get those same materials after this webinar. And that's Thank what you. I'll follow up with. Thank week. you so much. Okay. All okay. right. Let's move forward then and talk about what are some key differences in doing an online speech contest. I've made reference to a few of them. Bear with me, we'll be repetitive. I've tried to minimize it. First of all, what platform are you using? Your club, many clubs are using Zoom. Some are using other ones, particularly maybe if they're in a corporate setting and they have a corporate platform that they're using uh, for that, uh, their meetings, they may be using a different one. Some might be using Google Hangouts or other platforms. Zoom is a very good platform and is suggested uh, by those best practices guidelines that I mentioned from Toastmasters International. But the bottom line is they need to have good security features so we don't have uh, party crashers coming in and disrupting things. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary, did you go over what they are, the security features are? Well, one of those is pre-registration as you did for this evening's uh, okay. event and the, which has been used by uh, at district level and division level for holding meetings. So having those security features and being able to create certain blockouts, uh, whoever your chief judge is, it's run, it has control of your Zoom platform. When you establish a meeting, they'll know what the features are. You can create certain blocks for people coming in from different locations, maybe outside the district, but et cetera. So I, I have another question about that. So if our club meet, uh, our club contest is the 17th of November and they're going to use the same Zoom link that they always have. Okay. So how do I set up those security things if we already have a Zoom link that they're going to use. You're doing it as part of the club meeting? I mean, yeah, it's part of the club meeting. Okay. For, out, for your club members, you don't need to worry about that, obviously. But if you're having guests, for example, our club meets on a Zoom platform that one of our members has through work. And we provide a registration link through Eventbrite for outside guests. And that's what we include in our social media promotional channels. So that anybody that's not a member who is interested in attending an event, a club meeting, or in this case, a contest, would go through Eventbrite to register first. And so you recommend that and then we can send them the link? Yes. To... Okay, Yes. thank you. That way you control who's coming and know who's coming into your, your event. Okay. okay. So let's, let's see if we can keep rolling along here. Again, I mentioned the contest host several times and here's why you need a separate Zoom master to run the controls and keep track and maybe even take a picture of all the contestants after the uh, interviews when everybody's smiling and happy and then your winners individually, if you want to record, you know, keep that for posterity and for their benefit. Let's talk about some of the logistics differences. We've touched upon those a little bit in terms of, well, how do the judges submit their ballots? We talked about briefings. We found that it was very helpful in this past year to do not just your usual contestant briefing, judge briefing on site just before the contest begins, you know, a half hour before, 15 minutes before the contest is scheduled to start. Actually schedule it in advance. 
at least a couple days ahead of your contest. You so would like to dry can... run? To do what? Like to dry run, you go through the whole thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you don't, it doesn't have to be necessarily a full dry run, but at least get folks familiarized with the process. Check it out. You know, the, the uh, contest master can do a preliminary briefing with the contestants to make sure that their equipment is going to be uh, working, whatever device it is they're planning to use, preferably not smartphones, unless they need to use that separately just for calling in to the Zoom meeting to get a clear audio feed without interference. But as far as picture wise, it's a little shaky due to bandwidth. So preferable to use some sort of a laptop or uh, PC for the visual uh, video component. It might be a good idea if your contestants use uh, ear earphones with a wireless mic so they can move around more easily and still be heard, that their lighting is good, that everybody is using approximately the same type of uh, physical environment and that they can check their side to side movement that they stay within the range of their camera and not go out of the picture frame. Platform orientations for all the participants. Again, the contestants, but also judges. The chief judge needs to go over with them. How are they going to submit the ballots? Who, what's the preferred channel? Who are they sending them to? Can they do that? Do they understand the steps that need to be taken? So work all of these logistical arrangements out ahead of time, and then just review them at the briefing on the day of the contest for to make sure if there's any last minute questions that they get answered. It may also be useful to practice with the judges and with your table topics contestants and your sergeant at arms, how they are going to go in and out of the breakout rooms, how the Zoom master is going to signal to, the, uh, to them and to the sergeant at arms when to send in the next contestant. So all those things are important to work out before your contest starts, uh, before it actually gets down to the wire. Process differences. Okay, again, these are so, sort of built into what I've been talking about. It's a good idea to have alternate communication channels outside of your platform, outside of Zoom chat. Even with private chat, sometimes people forget and send a blast to everybody. You don't want your timers doing that, your judges doing that, your ballot counters. So you need another way of getting information to key people and for your key people to stay in touch with each other in case there's a problem with the technology. Interference, issues, what have you, you never know, right? So have a backup plan, whether it's direct call, <laughs> text messaging, email, something that someone's going to be aware of and keep track of, okay? So everybody can stay in touch. The chief contest chair and the chief judge and the Zoom master and the con potentially the contest master too, uh, all need to be able to contact each other somehow, some way. Right? And that goes for the timing report, how the contest Contest outcome results will be transmitted from the chief judge back to the contest chair and or shared with the contest master for making the announcements. And so the chief judge knows if there were any disqualifications that need to be announced, et cetera. So important to have multiple ways of communicating that can be kept um, confidential. Procedurally, 
Again, some of these have been mentioned already. Get all the forms for eligibility done ahead of time. Make sure that you have a way to determine what the speaking order will be. The Zoom master can make sure all audience members are muted and that videos remain off. Judges should keep their videos turned off as well, especially at advanced levels, probably less critical at the club level if they are club if they're club members. We know who the judges are then. Um, I mentioned the chief judge doing a, a reminder check with the speaker before each contestant goes. That might be deferred to the uh, contest master or even to the Zoom master to determine how best it, it should work. But just to make sure their equipment is on, they remember to uh, turn on their mic. We always all forget to unmute ourselves, don't we? And, Everybody's been muted with it's not their turn by the Zoom master. So remind your contestant, hey, make sure your camera's on. Make sure your mic is unmuted. Make sure you pin the timer or you know where to find them in the gallery. Okay. And then any other activities that need to occur outside of the main uh, event within the Zoom platform can be done in a breakout room. That's managed by the contest master. Rule differences. So this is important to recognize. I still have in here the original announcement. Uh, actually, it was the subsequent announcement at the beginning of last year's contest season from uh, Toastmasters International, and it still was reinforced for this year as well in a update back in May, or May or June, I think it was, probably June. Speech contest for the area, division, and district levels must be conducted online. It does not explicitly say that club contests have to be done online, but when you think about it, it makes sense because none of us are, very few of us so far are able to meet in person in our clubs. Some are, some are doing hybrid contests. I'm gonna mention something about that in a moment. Um, but by and large, all contests beyond the club level are going to be online. So we might as well get used to that and give our contestants the benefit of doing their club winning speech online as well. And that way they have the same experience that all the other contestants that they'll be facing up the line are getting. They're used to it, right? So let's give them that benefit. Let me also just mention that I checked earlier this summer with Toastmasters International about hybrid contest, how would those be managed? If some contestants or some judges are in person, some are online, it seemed like a big mess, very complex. The re simple response they came back with, the contest team was, hybrid contests are not recognized by Toastmasters International. You can do online contests or if it's appropriate within your district, uh, you can do in-person contests, but it's one or the other. So that simplifies things quite a bit. Now, another important rule to be aware of, if the technology does fail during the contest, during a contestant speech in particular, that the chief judge needs to determine how that situation will be managed. They should immediately pause the contest and make sure the timers have been briefed that they will stop timing at that point and remind them when that determination is made. Let the contestant know 
this is what they're doing when they pause the contest. They tell the contestant, we can't hear you. We can't see you. You're, you're breaking up, whatever it is. And it's to a point where it's extreme enough that it's interfering with the judges being able to judge that person's delivery. Everything should come to a halt until it gets resolved. The judge can be in contact with that contestant to determine if they are able to figure out what's going on and restore complete uh, presence through their video connectivity and their audio. And at that point, the contestant should begin their speech at the signal given by the chief judge to start from where they left off as close as they can. And they get an extra 30 seconds before being considered disqualified. In other words, for the international speech contest, they can go up to a full eight minutes. For the table topics, they can go up to a full three minutes, but you're not showing them the time. If they were in the red already, from the timer signal, it stays in the red. They know they've gone beyond the typical allowed amount of time or at three min at two minutes or for the table topics or seven minutes. The red stays up and they keep going until they're finished. And when they're finished, at that point, the timer records the actual time taken. And they may wanna make a note Chief Judge can ask them to make a note that they went beyond, but it was for technical reasons, beyond the usual, okay? Um, let's go on. So that gets us to the, through the bulk of our discussion, and we have about 10 minutes left. I want to just share with you a wrap up to the contest. Because now that the contest is done, everybody was, the winners were declared. The contest master thanked everybody and officially concluded the contest. But wait, there's more. There's the mop up activities, the housekeeping, the record keeping. What that involves is the contest master can do a debriefing with the chief judge and the Zoom master, how things were managed, where there were hiccups, what could be done differently or miscommunications, just to use that as a lessons learned actual, uh, activity, but also to remind the chief judge that that person is responsible for submitting the notification of winners of the two contests up the line to the next level contest, in which case that will likely be your area director who usually serves as the contest master for their contest, which is mandatory or required of them to have a contest. They may appoint someone else to be the contest master, but get it to the area director. Or if you're at the area director, you're an area director, get it to your division director or whoever's been designated as the contest chair. That's the list of the top three finishers in each contest with contact information. So that is an official form that you can find on Toastmasters International. It's referenced in the, uh, uh, at the back of the, of the rule book as well. Because we are doing these virtually, it's sometimes difficult to present the winners with their recognition awards, their ribbons, uh, or even their certificates. So follow through on that. Chief judge can handle that or the contest chair. And of course, thank everybody personally for their effort, time uh, that helped you make it happen. If you were doing an in-person contest, and sometimes if you, uh, for an online contest, if there were bills, invoices that were to be paid, get those paid, submit the expenses back to your treasurer, make sure it's in line with your budget. 
can, if possible, take note of what you learn from the experience for the benefit of next year's contest chair. Okay. So I have a question, Gary. It's a good time for additional questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so because it has, you had a, a, a line for expenses and bills and things, are we responsible as the club to actually purchase the trophy or do they just get the certificate? Great question, Allison. Typically clubs, at least in my experience, and I've been in the same club for a decade or more, but I've been to a couple of other club contests, they usually don't um, go to the expense of getting plaques or you know, these little statuettes or the other types of um, hardware uh, awards, maybe ribbons, often certificates of first place, second, and third. And again, those are available from online. I think I might have included those in the packet of materials I'm gonna send you, but you could certainly find those at the uh, speech contest link on Toastmasters International and in the store actually, the Toastmasters store. So you can get those. Typically clubs aren't purchasing uh, actual trophies. Okay. They might, they might do that um, if they, and it might be of a more, um, or less ostentatious <laughs> type. Okay. It might be a, a medallion, perhaps, uh, or a coin, or some, you know, something simple. Okay. Um, here's a reference to those international, uh, Toastmasters International resources I've been mentioning with the links that you can go to. Again, I'm going to share these with you. Uh, if you didn't already get them and the links to those, you can find them very easily though on Toastmasters International in the Leadership uh, Central, as well as some resources that we have compiled for our district, especially thanks to Dr. Alice Ann Crump putting together contest guide for connecting pathways projects to speech contest participation. This is where it pays dividends to see what you're doing as a judge or as a timer or as a con particularly as contest chair and contest chief judge who mastered. Ask Alice, ask Alice Ann. <laughs> You can turn anything that you're doing into a project. Absolutely. A project. Am I right? <laughs> Absolutely. If you Absolutely. have any doubt. So <laughs> last year at the beginning, Alison put this together for us. We will share that with you. We probably could update it, but believe Absolutely. me, if there's a way to find a, a, a elective or an assignment or a project in a path on Pathways, you can do it and just give a speech, get evaluated and share your experience. Absolutely. And make progress in advancing your education. Absolutely. Okay? You can even think, and let me just say this, as a contest chair and as a chief judge who carry the most burden of putting a contest together, use that as your leadership project for earning your uh, DTM. It pays off, okay? And I mentioned a couple of these other things, some of which I already shared out, uh, the contest planning timeline, uh, the frequently asked, well, I gave some of the FAQs, but not all of them. So we'll get these other documents over to you. Uh, to those who we have registered, and I believe everybody will be registered. I see we're up to almost a dozen and a half folks. So thank you all for joining us, even if you had to come in late. I hope we've been able to cover all the questions in your mind. 
uh, a bot contest. So what I'd like to do is invite you at this point to complete a second poll right here uh, as to what you've gained from this contest as far as confidence. And can I ask my co-host, Tom Maria, to share that with us for everyone. How confident are you now about conducting an online speech contest before, as compared to before you arrived, before you sat in? Where are you at? Let's do a little finger in the wind. See which way the winds are blowing. See, a couple of people have responded. Everybody feel free to chime in here. Let us know. What do you think? Are you confident? Very confident? Or still wondering? So we have everyone now. Okay. Well, let's, I see we've made some progress. We've moved up the ladder here. Very confident and completely confident. I'd say 100% there of our respondents. I think you're feeling better, feeling good. So we'll end that poll. I'm glad you feel like this was worthwhile. And uh, I don't know if we have to share these results or not, but if we can just take it down, please say we've seen it. In conclusion, be bold, be planful be organized and go forth and have a contest and make it fun for everyone. When you check out of this event, when you leave the meeting, you will also get a follow-up survey of about 10 or 11 questions that we'd ask you to complete to give us feedback on how well we did in communicating about how to run a contest as a contest chair this evening what you liked, what you would like better, and any suggestions for improvement. So uh, if there are no other questions, I can entertain maybe one more before we reach our 7.30 mark here. We have three minutes. Any final questions? Oh, I see, that was our chat. I don't, I was have, a, I don't have a question. But do have a statement. I, I really appreciate you mentioning that you were gonna have this tonight. And I'm I'm glad I was able to come in. I had the issue with my husband earlier, but okay. I am so glad I was able to come because now I have been a contest uh chief judge. I know I've served in that capacity. I've also served in the capacity of a contest master but I was not the contest chair. And it's so great to see the difference of roles and responsibility of each. And now mm -hmm. that I am a contest chair, oh. it's gonna have contests on the 17th right. of November. I need to get get all of my paperwork in order, get, get yes. my judges and all of that other stuff together. And yes. I, I'm really glad that I came. I learned a lot. Thank you very, Good. very much. <laughs> Okay, well, you are I certainly really welcome. I'm glad it. you were able to attend, Alsan, and that I saw your text message ahead of time for a change. <laughs> so we could, I could get the information <laughs> to you. But as well, the fact that um, once you appoint your, con your chief judge, you can delegate some of those uh, activities to them. The chief judge can handle your recruitment with your support uh, of judges mm -hmm. and other functionaries too. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Well, you are welcome as well. Thank you for being with us. And uh, let's close this out. We'll end our, uh, my co-host will end our, our recording. Thank you again.